Dr. Randolph Severson is a family therapist and clinical fellow in the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Dr. Severson explores place, family, culture, history, tradition, music, and faith in his work. During the mid and late 1970s and early 1980s, he was James Hillman's student, graduate assistant, and managing editor and partner at Spring. Randolph. The archetypal answer to a soul psychology for the 21st century is an emotional language of culture. The response to depth, in my mind, is intensity, an intense response. It must respond with passion, with aesthetic intensity. And then the second from Pierre Michon, a wonderful French writer, finally being translated and receiving due recognition. He writes, I cannot write without singing. Today, Apollo, and very much aware of Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye, in its exposure of how viciously oppressive our classical Western canon and ideals of beauty often are, and thus the risk in assaying any sort of expressly aesthetic psychology, I want to talk about the black Apollo. The black Apollo with the dusky Venus in Roger Bastide's famous monograph. With her poet's fine eye rolling, Maya Angelou on the Today Show, during Brian Cumble's last week on the air, recalled with joy his first appearance. The first appearance of an African-American man as the host of what by then had become a national institution. Like a young Apollo you were, she mused. Who could have witnessed Muhammad Ali in his prime? Who could have witnessed the fight, the rumble in the jungle? the battle between the heavyweight champ George Foreman and even the aging Ali, and not thought of Apollo, which is exactly what Sylv uh, Sylvester Stallone did, and so named his fallen and soon to be resurrected black heavyweight champ in the Rocky movies, Apollo Creed. And then as plain as the nose on your face, right under our noses, the archetypal nose that David Miller so brilliantly sensitized a few years back, the black Apollo, the link between Apollo and African-American music and culture, the Harlem Apollo, a mecca and an epicenter for great black artists, live at the Apollo, where everyone from Duke Ellington to James Brown performed. Among the esthetes and the classicists in Alden's famous poem, Under Which Lyre, and in archetypal psychology as well, Apollo has incurred a bad rap. I want to return him to the street to find him leaning against a lamppost in New York City. With a Hillman flourish, I want to turn Apollo's bad rap into a rapper, Apollo the poet. And the one thing the myths all agree on is Apollo was a musician, a poet, and a healer, his association with the sun being a rather late development. Apollo, then, is a hip-hop artist. I want to talk about the black Apollo. I want to color him blue, color him blue like Miles Davis classic jazz album. In Moonlight, black boys look blue, as one of the characters says in that extraordinary lyrical masterpiece, winner of last year's Academy Award for Best Picture, Moonlight. It's easy to find the Apollo in Moonlight. Apollo is born by the light of the moon, so to speak. His sister Artemis precedes him in birth and assists their mother Leto in delivering him. And easy to find the moonlight in, in Apollo, easy to find the street kid. Apollo is a floater. You remember Hera's hatred of Leto, Apollo's mother, her hatred for all of Zeus's paramours and bastard children. Apollo is a bastard, the child of a mother on the run, a desperate fugitive. Think of her in a bathtub or the back of a car, the stabs and waves of labor rushing over her, her features twisted in pain about to deliver. No room for her at the inn, no husband in tow or to guide her all alone. Hera had decreed she could not deliver anywhere on earth on terra firma. So Zeus created a floating island, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. A floater, floating, family moving from place to place, evicted, on the street, in the shelter, a kid floating back and forth between adults, shelter, foster care, family, grandparents, unable often to answer so easy a question is, where do you live? When you're an agency therapist, when you're a CPS or foster care worker, this is an all too familiar scenario. 
kids, people, families floating between housing, shelter, and the street, kids in the foster care system, the shadow family of the gang. You wonder how they do it, how they manage to stay afloat, how even in the midst of such hopelessness and deprivation, they manage to survive, to show the sort of resilience and resourcefulness that when you live a more advantaged life can seem almost sociopathic. By hook, by crook, by stealth, the artful dodger, they do it. And amid this big float, amid all this desolation, hope peeks through, people bond, find what they're looking for, the human touch, respite, care, a helping hand, someone who takes them in. In the movie Moonlight, where black boys look blue in the moonlight, this contemporary Apollonic tale, the kid, a black street kid whose name is Chiron. With Chiron, the kintar in the midst, of course, being the foster son and student of Apollo, whom people call little whose mom, Paula, a nurse, does float, is a user, a crack addict, floats back and forth between his mom and the couple who become his other family. The man, Juan, whose name in the original screenplay and in the real life of the screenwriter, screenwriter was Blue, who finds him squatting forlorn in an abandoned crack house, befriends him, becoming over time very much a foster father, a mentor, a loving mentor. We might say his partner, Teresa, another mother, a warm, nurturing, protective presence who does give him clean sheets, makes his bed, tucks him in when he stays overnight with him as he often does. The tragic irony here, fit only for a myth or a Greek tragedy, Juan, the foster father, father Blue, a noble, tender, inspiring teacher and mentor, is a pusher. He's the drug connection, the apex of the pyramid, the pusher ultimately responsible for providing Chiron's mother with her drugs. How do you escape from this in real life? As I say, you've got to learn to keep your head above water. You can float for a while, but if you want to do more than just survive, you've got to learn to swim. You've got to grow up fast, which is exactly what Apollo did. The myths tell us he grew up in just four days, four days, and then he turned himself into a dolphin, hurled himself onto the deck of a floundering ship, saved it, and guided it to safety. Like the kid in Moonlight, or the, or the kid like him, Apollo grew up fast, grew up faster than anyone ought to. The story in Moonlight takes place on the coast in Liberty City, Miami, an island in its own way as much as Delos. The sea is a constant presence. The movie comes full circle and ends with the kid becoming an adult looking out at the sea. One of the most transporting scenes occurs early on with Juan, Blue, the father, Pusher teaching the kid how to keep his head above water, how to float, how to swim, swimming, swimming in the Gulf, a supreme metaphor of life. Okay, says Juan, let your head rest in my hand. Relax, I got you. I promise I won't let you go. Hey man, I got you. There you go, 10 seconds. Right there, you're in the middle of the world. The street kid takes the water like a dolphin. In the myths, after Apollo is back on dry land, he heads to Python, an oracle sacred to the goddess, where he slays the dragon, the great serpent, the python. Now here again, I want to part ways with the conventional Nietzsche-inspired Jungian archetypal psychology interpretation of the great serpent and slaying of the dragon. In an Apollonic world, in the world of moonlight, whatever else the python symbolizes, it symbolizes this, the way prejudice and persecution, harassment by the cops, poverty, drugs, liquor stores, prostitution, bad schools, broken families, inadequacy in everything, including basic services. The heat doesn't work, the water pipes are broken, the toilet won't flush, the apartment swimming pool a death trap, air conditioning, forget it. Can rapids coils around you? get you in a stranglehold, smother you, seize you in its yawning jaws, and devour every dream, every shred of hope you've ever had. If you meet this dragon on the road, kill it. If you don't kill that snake, it kills you, and you become part of the cycle, the sinister Ouroboros of wasted dreams, wasted lives. Chiron Little is eventually dubbed black by his friend Kevin, Juan is dead, he's in high school now, tormented, bullied, because people think he's gay. One of the most moving scenes in any film I've ever seen is when Little's still a child. Ask Juan and Teresa what faggot means, and Juan replies, 
Faggot is a word used to make gay people feel bad. His chief tormentor, Terrell, forces his friend Kevin to turn on him, turn on him to betray him, to pound him to a bloody pulp in front of a crowd of kids who urge Terrell on and then join in to stop Kyron until a teacher intervenes. Kyron refuses to name his attacker, the Omerta of Honor in the Hood, but the next day from outside the school, he storms through the hall and into the classroom like a wolf on the fold. The wolf is sacred to Apollo. Storms in, storms in like Apollo down from Olympus as in the Iliad. And Phoebus Apollo heard him and strode down along the pinnacles of Olympus, angered in his heart, carrying across his shoulders the bow and the hooded quiver. And the shafts clashed on the shoulders of the god, walking angrily. Chiron grabs a chair and smashes it hard into the back of the seated Terrell, knocking him stunned and staggering to the ground, then standing astride him and slamming the chair down again and again and again on the prostrate body. There may not be much Apollo in Achilles, but there's a lot of Achilles in Apollo. In the Iliad, the god and the hero are often paired. A long suppressed anger, a hidden fury, a cruelty and stone cold rage, Achilles calls him the most malignant of gods, so too with Chiron, so too with so many young African-American males, so too with Apollo. Think of his countless corpses buried or burning on the beach in the Iliad from his poisoned arrows. Think of the killing of the python and the cyclops in defiance of his father Zeus. His and his sisters merciless mowing down one by one of Niobe's sons and daughters, all because she refused to give their mother her propers. Guiding Paris's arrow to Achilles' heel, the flaying alive of Marcius. It's Apollo's feast day when Odysseus slays all the suitors. And all in the grip and in the name of a long denied and long deferred but infinitely simple justice in response to the brutality visited on them from birth. After the incident at school and police report, Chiron Black goes to jail. And we don't see him again until he reemerges, now very much in the more classical image of Apollo, except for the gold grill in his teeth. Ripped, ominous, powerfully muscled, driving a muscle car, he's followed in his father's footsteps. An independent businessman, an entrepreneur, capitalized on the only real opportunity existing in the neighborhood. That is, he deals drugs himself. Then one night on impulse and maybe drawn by destiny, he drives all night back to Miami to look up Kevin, whom after Kevin, cook and owner of a seaside cafe now, shuts down for the night, he joins in a, Kevin's apartment to enjoy an ineffably tender skin on skin, raw moment of defenseless human intimacy. You remember that after slaying the Cyclops in revenge for forging the lightning bolt that kills his beloved son, Asclepius, Apollo too, like Chiron, teeters on the edge of banishment but Zeus commutes the sentence to a year's hard labor. Apollo, too, is a jailbird on a chain gang in prison garb. Orange is the new black, a con, an ex-con, walking the yard, enduring the challenges, pumping iron, avoiding rape, enduring the solitude, the fear, the unrelenting loneliness that manifests itself and the lights go out in screams, yes, and also in the sounds of muffled sobs and moaning. The character Little Chiron Black is not a loser, in fact, anything but. But he is someone so hurt, so damaged, that he can't get close, can't allow hardly anyone to reach, to touch him until the very last. And whether that occurs as, uh, at the film, as the film ends is very much a question. The mood in the movie is sadness. A deep, lyrical, moonlit sadness suffuses the film. Black is not a loser, not completely, nor is Apollo. As with Chiron, Apollo's rage alloys with gentleness that protect his own. Apollo protected the humiliated corpse of Hector from decay, and that reaches out almost despite himself for tenderness and love. Even so, the key to Apollo is Apollo is, Apollo is a loser. He loses in war. He loses in love. Call him Mr. Pitiful. Like Otis Redding, the big O sings, how can I explain to you how someone can get so very blue that nobody seems to understand what can ma make a man feel so blue? They call me Mr. Pitiful. That's how I got my name. How does he lose? Let me count the ways. The Trojans get stomped, just like Chiron. Apollo can only hinder not delay, and delay their destruction. And boy, does he lose in love. 
There is Daphne who scorns and flees from him. There is Leucothea whom he causes to be buried alive, Marpesa, Castalia, Cassandra, Hyacinth, the list goes on and on. As much as with any God, it's through our loss, our grief, our sadness, through our sickness unto death, through the it's eating up our insides kind of agony. It's Apollo's music that finally cures and releases Prometheus by putting the eagle to sleep, that we connect to Apollo and the God in us. The key to Apollo is he's a loser, a loser in love and war. And the key to Apollo is the color blue, feeling blue, getting the blues. Blue Apollo is the name of a butterfly, the name of a species of soul. The blue is in part spiritual, a Miles Davis, Joni Mitchell kind of blue. As Stanley Crouch says about Miles' trumpet style, a cool mist or blast of blue flame. Elegant, elegant, elegant. An equivalent to the Latin claritas, the simplicity and radiance of pure form. It's Ezra Pound's God's float in the azure air but it's also earthy, like a John Lee Hooker, Muddy Waters, or Howlin' Wolf song. Apollo is the god of music. If the key to Apollo is that he's always feeling blue, then his gift is this, out of the blues, a feeling blue, he makes music. He makes the blues. Loss, sadness, desolation, row. That's where we meet Apollo. Vanquished, rarely victor, unlucky in love. He's blue, he's feeling blue. And then he picks up a lyre like Muddy Waters deep down in the Delta. At first as an eight-year-old boy, a harmonica, and then a guitar. Or like Socrates while in prison. Prison, a dream, bids him take up and cultivate music. He composes a hymn to Apollo. Call it the Hymnlock Blues. The great Albert Murray who spoke what was it now nearly 40 years ago at a Dallas Institute conference much like this one was the great theoretician of the blues. His fundamental insight was that the blues is defined by the counterstatement of the music to the lyrics. While the lyrics are doleful, full of misery and lament, the music through its rhythm and its beat is jubilant, ebullient, affirmative, sensual, sexual as a pounding heart and perfumed flesh. Red dirt, sawdust, the scent of magnolia, honeysuckle, tobacco, alcohol, perfume, cologne, hair tonic, sweat, hanging in the air and outside beneath the moon, coupled with the murmur of water running over the rocks, floating of a breeze, celebratory of all that is good in life. If the lyric is Jeremiah in Lamentation, the music is the Song of Solomon. To use a beautiful phrase from Robinson, Robinson Jeffers, the blues makes our pain shine, the way it shines through Robert Kugelman's new book on pain. And for Murray, the signature of the blues, of mood indigo, Duke Ellington's greatest composition, of what Murray calls the blues idiom, which he believed to be the native tongue of America, a mulatto country. Yes, a nation, a nationalism, but not of founding documents, not of laws, not of race, not of ethnicity, but of culture, is elegance. Apollo is Gable, or Billy Dee Williams, or Chadwick Boseman, T'Challa, Black Panther, in the, uh, and uh, De Chalo is, uh, uh, Bo Bozeman's also the author of a wonderful play called Deep in Azure. Now, isn't, the same, isn't it the same with archetypal psychology? Isn't that finally the distinguishing mark, the defining character, perhaps, of archetypal psychology? Is that it speaks the blues idiom, whether in Hillman Lopez or Patricia Berry. The subjects, the themes emerge usually from the dark side. It's always limits, shadow, suicide, darkness, perversity, death, the hermaphrodite, Dionysus, destruction, pathology, the brood of night, Ananke, Duende. It ought to be a downer. It ought to be a drag. But the style, medium, the Delphic density, the incantations and incarnational rhythms, the twist and repetitions, the poetic compressions, the dazzle and the range of the scholarship is exhilarating. To read these writers, to practice what they preach, remember Hillman, to respond to death with intensity, to stick to the image, exalt the arts, embrace the body, extol history, culture, myth with those extraordinary improvisational vamps and riffs and archetypes and myth themes. It's just so damn much fun. <laughs> Bearing sorrow, having fun. That's Greg Allman's Sweet Melissa. Sums up life, doesn't it? Bearing sorrow, having fun. Sweet Melissa, 
Melissa, Greek for bee. The hum of the bees in Virgil or Gopi Krishna. There was now a cadence like the humming of a swarm of bees enchanting and melodious, and the encircling glow is replaced by a penetrating silver radiance, already a feature of my being within and without. The meaning is Thanatos, the medium is Eros, the goal is elegance. The source, the gift, the black Apollo. Hail, Lord Apollo, whose bees, as Callimachus tells us, fed the sacred springs at Delos. Well, I'm a king bee, baby, buzzing around your hive. If there was ever a psychology that makes you want to get up and dance, tap dance perhaps, an old man's endearing whimsy, or the anima angel, animal revealing its essence. Tap, dance, boom, 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 twisting the night away. It's archetypal psychology. And in this way, a sort of an antiodromia, a return, the repressed Apollo, the black Apollo, not only reascends Olympus, rejoins the pantheon of archetypal psychology. He becomes its patron, its tutelary deity. Beyond anything else, it seems to me, it is the dazzle of the style, the stylum, the music and poetry that animates the work of James Hillman, that gives it soul, that distinguishes and differentiates it from all other psychologies and psychologists. As much as I've read Hillman, and I still read him, but it's not for the content, I know that backwards and forwards. Instead, I realize I read him in the same way and for the same reason that I listen to favorite recordings, for the sound of it, for that sound for the sheer unadulterated pleasure of it, for the billowing music and the virtuoso rhythms of the magnificent prose, and in person, a vaudeville timing. Archetypal psychology is less a vision than a vibe, a communal one, two, three, four, that it's likely to live on, live on as Hillman hoped and called for in the quotation I've taken as a motto for this essay, live on as an emotional, intense, passionate, and I would add on the evidence of Hillman's own example, musical, cultural language. As the classicist Werner Jaeger says in his three-volume Padea, for the Greeks, when it came to the formation of the soul to soul-making, it's only words, it's only sound and rhythm that matters. The beat goes on, the pan and the dithyram too. If you got rhythm, as Ella Fitzgerald doing Brooklyn Born Gershwin and Robert Sardello on Cynix and Puer showed us, if I, if you got rhythm, who would ask for anything more? Poetry, music, healing to Lord Apollo, the black Apollo, God of music, poetry, and healing, we owe this. Roll over Beethoven and Freud and Jung and the DSM and CBT and MBT. <laughs> And all the rest, I need a shot of Hillman. I need a shot of rhythm and blues. Keats ended his hymn to Apollo by addressing Apollo directly. Let me follow in Keats' footsteps, but shift the rhythm just a bit so that it's more like sliding slow, like a king snake through a barn lot, or stepping high in a sky blue northern late October through a dust gold corn or snow starred cotton field. Let me end not with Keats, but with John Lee Hooker and the song, The Healer. Lord God, God of music, poetry, prophecy, Lord Apollo, the healer. Blues, a healer all over the world. Blues, a healer, healer all over the world, all over the world. It healed me, it can heal you. The blues can heal you. I was down, I was down, it healed me. Lord, 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 yes it did. Thank you. Mm -hmm.